I think the world would be better if Disney executives knew what it meant to be in the mascots at some point in time, because that stuff is just absolutely miserable. What we're going to say is extraordinarily simple. There are, one, sets of benefits that accrue to workers, and two, sets of benefits that accrue to companies, and we're going to win on those things exclusively. The first thing I want to talk about is the framing. What does this look like? Right now at big law firms, your best lawyers devote 10, 20% of their time to things like pro bono work. They are paid accordingly, so when they take on pro bono cases, they don't receive the commissions that they do for working on really nice rich people cases, and they have to devote a certain amount of time to it. That is exactly the same sort of model that we see happening here. It is, one, you work the entry job, two, you get paid accordingly, three, we're going to make you spend a lot of time with this, like 10, 20% of your workforce is a lot, so that's what we think we're going to do. Six months, five years, that seems to be right, so like every five years or some similar period of time, if Op wants to argue implementation, we can, we don't think this is going to be an issue, because we have pointed out that big law can do this, literally anyone else can, although, you know, lawyers, I don't know. Uh, in any case, I think what we're going to say is extraordinarily simple. That, one, this is staggered, so it's not like all the managers take off at the same time. There are no disruptions to the workforce. And two, I would point out that this happens all the time in terms of people taking leave, going on non-competes. It obviously doesn't screw with the biggest firms. We don't think it happens here. Again, if they want to hassle us on implementation, they're free to. It's just not relevant to the debate. Two arguments. One, I want to talk about workers. There are three sorts of benefits that accrue to workers. First, and literally most tangibly, is that the sorts of policies that people implement, i.e. pay, are you unionizing or not, do you get health care, what are the basic worker safety standards like, all of those become significantly better. Recently, there's an example of a private equity company that went in and started buying up big factories in Ohio. All of these places had terrible workers' rights conditions. Because all of the people who were in charge of these companies were headquartered in New York or in DC, who never actually saw what was going on in their factories and never had to experience the sorts of things going on in their factories. That is the basic number one thing that we change. One, because you experience it, but two, because people are literally able to confront you about it in a way that you cannot when they are removed from you, i.e. you have much more access and ability to voice your problems and say, not only is it your policies that hurt me, it is the basic rights and standards that you have in your company that are affecting me right now. People cannot hide behind email chains from New York. They cannot hide behind corporate deniability. They cannot say, we never received that email because it is there, it is tangible, and you are there. I want to be clear that this assumes like the worst faith on part of corporate executives that literally, at best, they can no longer claim deniability. The much more realistic case, and I think the case that opposition has to engage in if they want to win this, is one in which the vast majority of people are just not terrible. Like they are good and they operate in good faith. So when corporate executives go and they see people being mistreated, or at a very basic stance, when they get a minimum wage and they see that it is hard for people to live on there, because I want to characterize the panel, how much of your working life you're spending with these guys. You're spending like 10, 12 hours a day with these guys for three months, six months straight. That is an insane amount of time, even at your worst and your most isolated, you obviously make friends. We're not saying you have to go for like after work dinners or like go on vacation to Disneyland with these people, but it is obvious that when you spend more time with people, you become better friends with them. Case in point, Maddie and Yeju. I like Yeju, didn't like Maddie, but now I do because I spend so much time with him on the debate team. I think what is extraordinarily simple is, one, acting in good faith means that people are likely to be receptive to the sorts of changes, so when they get back into management, they implement better policies, and that is a good thing. And two, even in the worst case, workers are better off because it is harder for corporations to claim deniability. It is harder for them to shut out people's concerns perpetually. The second way we help workers is actually very important because it is about mobility. So right now, the biggest problem is that corporate executives and like the managerial class are largely elite. They went to good private schools, they went to good universities, and they stay in those universities. So when a Fortune 500 CEO wants someone else, most of the time they don't appoint someone from their own company, they lateral someone over from another company. And this is damaging, because the biggest harm is that the workers, like the ba most basic unit of your company, is just not well trained ever. They don't receive the skills, they don't receive the connections, they don't receive the ability to succeed. And I think it's actually really important, like at our most cynical, it is a strictly good thing for workers that are now in the same room working with Ivy League University people to be able to get their skills, get their connections, but at a more basic level, just mimic their behavior. Like, so much work has been done on how poor, uh, like, like lower income people are able to rise up through the ranks in corporations by mimicking the behavior of managers. We make this so much easier by literally putting you in the same room. So, at your worst, 
people individually are able to succeed in the company. They are able to move up. That is a tangible difference that they will never access. It is well, lower income people working managerial jobs being able to get the skills that they need to succeed, or at their most basic, speak in the world of the rich or speak in the world of the upper middle class. Open it. Given the level of media coverage, like a lot of Amazon executives probably know that their workers are in shit condition. Why do they not change that? Because they don't internalize it. And it's so easy when you see something in the media to be like, oh, guys, come on, that's media overhyped. It is so easy to bury this in corporate double speak. And this is the problem that they miss. Yes, these problems come out in the media. They come out years down the line. Amazon has been exploiting workers for, like, let's face it, like quite a long time. And just because you heard about this in the media does not change the fact that corporations can say, this is not our fault. These people are choosing to work it. It is different when you yourself are working it and are more close to the people that are now confronted with the problems. I'll take closing if they have a POI. Yeah, in the status quo, there are already corporate regulations about minimum labor conditions, labor standards, and the rise of social media using call it bad labor practices to a large extent. What's the delta? I actually, actually, to an extent, I do think it's very easy to undermine labor standards, especially in places where you have big private equity firms that carve out all these factories and say, oh, we're not interested in like ignoring the safety standards, but they just don't enforce it as much as they could. I want to point out, the SEC receives like 5% of the funding that they do. OSHA, less than 3% of the funding that they ask for routinely is allocated to them. That is the Occupational Safety and Hazards Administration that is just woefully underfunded. So yes, there are laws, you get no enforcement. Second argument, companies, this is not disruptive, it's obviously not, there are two big benefits. One, the workers themselves learn from people at the top, so they become better. It is literally more efficient to have workers that are put in a place where they get the skills that other people are trying to teach them. Training is a good thing that corporations do not fund all the time because they would rather pay money on things like bonuses. This is a very simple cost-free mechanism to actually give people training that results in huge benefits for the company and also higher wages because with more productivity, with more like production, literally just comes higher wages. That is a good in and of itself. The second good is efficiency in terms of management. So there's a big problem right now because when you have private equity companies that do carve outs or lateral transfers from other Fortune 500 companies, these people have no clue what goes in on the ground. So they'll fire some workers that were essential because they are the only ones with technical knowledge for these sorts of things and your company as a result loses efficiency. You need people that work these entry level jobs because that is the only way they know what's going on in their own company. Very proud to propose. I know it's policy, but you're all comfortable with me taking off my mask, right? Yeah. yeah. Starting in three, two, one. The clash of opening opposition will be very simple. One, this is worse for workers. Secondly, we think that this forces corporations to either uninform, uh, underperform, and lay off more workers in the long run. And thirdly, this undermines a lot of strong enforcement from labor unions, the law, and workers in general, because it's harder to talk shit about your boss when they're right next to you. Let's go to the first argument. Why is this worse for workers? Responses will be integrated. The main claim coming from opening government is that basic worker, standards, say worker safety standards will improve because management level will be able to experience these things and will be able to have some kind of sympathy because they don't want to get hurt. Four levels of response towards this. One, this is completely untrue because the majority of their time, they will still be in lush offices in the very first place. But secondly, they do not live the lives of these workers. They can go home to luxury homes and apartments. That means that they are separate conditions in the very first place, so it's easy for them to escape this kind of reality. But thirdly, we think that they're very rational people, that if it competes against their interest for a larger bonus in the long run, if it competes against their interest, for example, more vacation days, when they do not let these people like in the cake more vacation this, they are likely to vote within their own interests. But fourthly, and most importantly, even if they operate in good faith, I think self-interest trumps that because they understand they are still management, their role doesn't change, they still have all of the luxuries and can only implement it temporarily. No thank you. But secondly and more importantly, I would argue that this is immediately worse for workers because they feel watched. They are stressed by the fact that upper management can easily see the mistakes that they are going to do. This is harmful because not only when they feel watched or they their mistake, we think it results in large bad corporate dynamics in the very first place. It is harder for you 
you to like work on your own spreadsheet, or it's harder for you to have a good relationship with your worker because some of them are sucking up to the boss while they're still in the same front level desk in the very first place. But fourthly, they were right to point out that managers are incredibly elitist. That's why it's difficult for them to understand why they eat these kinds of meals, for example, in the break room and the like. So it's immediately worse for these workers because they're significantly more stressed out and significantly more psychologically damaged. But secondly, how is management likely to react to this? Because it is true that they might operate in good faith, but if they come from the same elitist universities, if they come from the same privileged backgrounds as Prime Minister so, so persuasively claims, then there are two problems to this. One, they're likely to resent this kind of policy. But secondly, and more importantly, they're likely to discredit a lot of the work of these entry-level jobs in the very first place. They're likely to argue that, hey, it is easy to work on a spreadsheet. Or, hey, it doesn't look that complicated in the very first place. This is harmful, because when you give them this kind of experience, they're likely to make bad policy decisions for the corporation and for the people in the, those jobs. Why is that the case? They're likely to do things like automation, lay off more workers because they understand that one person can work the two front-level desk jobs, and we think that's incredibly harmful, and we think that's how people in upper management and middle management levels are likely to work. But if you want to talk about people understanding like the complexities or the struggles of people working the front desk, I think there are a lot of lower management people that are able to easily communicate that to upper level management, and that's how we build on efficiency. The third thing I want to argue here is that it is significantly more difficult for entry level workers to unionize and galvanize against management. One, you cannot complain against your boss because they're directly next to you. But secondly, and more importantly, it is harder to discuss the inefficiencies of management, not because of the social awkwardness of it, but secondly, and more importantly, your boss can directly criticize you, rebut you on the very first place, delegitimizing your plight, delegitimizing your struggle of working a job until 6 p.m. and having to clock out. We think that this is harder for people to exhibit change, harder for unions to be able to negotiate, and harder for unions to make platforms that benefit them. Fourthly, and most importantly, I would argue that it is harder for people that work in human capital or sorry, human resources or managerial roles to execute their position because they rely on a certain level of distance to be able to make hard, to be able to make good decisions on how to manage worker dynamics. Because if the human resources person or your manager who is supposed to settle conflict disputes develops friendships or relationships with those workers, it is more likely to be biased and more likely to be harmful to be able to kind of settle those disputes. That's why it's significantly worse for workers in all scenarios. Before I move on, close it. Uh, broadly, do you think that automation is good or bad for companies and the economy? I think that there is a that I think corporations have to strike a balance with this. But the problem here is, is that in your side you incentivize a lot of upper management levels to directly use automation if they feel that this work should not be credited as much. Let's move on to the second argument. I'll take you after this. How does this force corporations to underperform and risk for, like operational jeopardy? There are two levels towards this. Open government says that you're more likely to mimic the behavior of these people. I think that's one scenario. We dealt with that in the first argument. I think the other scenario is that you make bottom line work significantly more inefficient. I think, one, a lot of these people are bad at the seemingly quote-unquote mundane things entry-level workers do because they come from the very elite universities that you go to. But secondly and more importantly, when you make these kinds of like work significantly more inefficient, we think that these upper level management, one, have no incentive to do their job well because there's no ultimate consequence to them. But thirdly, it is hard for other like people like interns or entry level workers to correct them in the very first place because of the same fact that they still hold a managerial position. They still hold your employment on the line. That's why you make bottom line work far more inefficient. But secondly, more importantly, I would argue that you'll trade off on human capital. What is the value added of these managers? And why is it important that we keep them in these managerial positions? I think they make decisions or tough decisions and how the workforce or the dynamic of the workforce should be. I think they have organizational expertise that they have to dedicate all their time to because a lot of the positions you argue take a lot of time and take a lot of effort. We think you make it harder for people to coordinate. You make it harder for people to make the time-consuming choice. That's why oftentimes these corporations lose money, meaning that they lead to unemployment or forcibly laying off people. Before we move on, sure, closing. Opening. Thanks. Uh, even if the CEO is not in your office, all of your arguments still stand because you're still afraid of being watched by your managers. You're still afraid of joining a union because of what your manager might say. None of your arguments make any difference just because Jeff Bezos is now in the office. That's not true because Jeff Bezos knows your name directly, knows your face, and can fire you immediately. Let's move on to the third argument. They said that corporate. Okay, why do corporate? Why do conditions improve on our side? But before I moved on, uh, before I moved on, I want to talk about like training and all of these things. One that's like false. I think we hire based on performance, so training doesn't matter.
matter. And secondly, more importantly, there's a profit incentive to train your workforce, and there's an efficiency in management that exists. I think most corporations do that. But why do corporations improve, or why do contritions improve in our set? Because if your policy fails, or if your policy leads to these corporations underperforming, you have less money and resources and the ability to improve the working conditions, improve the office spaces, improve the areas for these people that work in. But secondly, if it is successful, I would argue it is very marginal. Because a lot of the time, people either think that this is an easy job, meaning that it's harder for people to unionize, harder for people to demand more. That's why we think incentives stay on our side to improve the working conditions of these people. For all these reasons and more, the motion falls. Thank you. to unionize, or you try to file a sexual harassment complaint, or you try to file a complaint about benefits, there's a, a silent manager who's hidden in the anonymity of the masses colossus that is Amazon that can fire you. Imagine now there's Jeff Bezos working next to you, and you try to unionize, and the next day you get fired. That's going to be in every single headline across the planet. The reason that Aditya asked that point of information was that it is true that everything in their case is symmetric because managers can still fire you, managers can still oust you if you try to file a harassment complaint, all of those things. What we do is shine a spotlight because the thing that people care about are the executives at the top, the high level managerial positions. Think about how no plausible deniability exists anymore. Think about how in every single company, whenever you try to file a complaint about harassment or otherwise, they never say that we're not going to do it. It's just that, well, we'll get in touch with you in six weeks because they're in the DC office, and right now they're traveling, they had their third child, and all of that stuff. That person is now sitting next to you. So you know what? Fuck social awkwardness, and also fuck supervision. You're now sitting next to that person, and if now they try to fire you, everyone knows why it happened. That's the fundamental difference between opening opposition and opening government. Three pieces of analysis they completely missed. One, the argument from workers learning from management wasn't that you don't get trained to be in that job, it's that you stay in that job forever because it's a bottom feeder job and you're in occupational cyclical poverty. You never quit that shitty job in Stanton, Pennsylvania if you watch The Office because you stay there, but if you have a high level management executive working with you, then there's a chance you might get promoted. That was the point about learning. Number two, workers make connections with these people. And the argument here wasn't like, oh, I went to Costa with you the other day, can you get me a promotion? Is that they don't have plausible deniability anymore. So the next time you send your resume to HR, this person might have worked with you six months ago, so we remove that aspect of it. Number three, workers get better conditions. And here the argument was completely missed by leader of opposition. The intuition here isn't that they can't be on a yacht in Trieste in six months' time. It's that for every five years, they do have to work that shitty job for six months. And you know what? Rich people tend to be fucking spoiled. So what that means is that they are internal selfish incentives that they themselves plug to make those jobs better. Right? Like the only thing worse than doing a poor job is a rich person doing a poor job. So you want to make sure that that poor job's a bit better the next time you have to do it. I think that's really important. But secondly, honestly, I don't understand why these people don't have good faith. Because you can talk all you want about, you know what, media coverage about Amazon exists. I'm going to stand behind the claim that personal experience matters. Right? Like, it's important to say that these people will make connections with these people. I don't understand who this human being is who every five years for six months talks to no one, develops no human relationships, sticks to their Excel sheets, and then quits and then comes back again after every five years. Right? Like, realistically, this person is going to have some sense of human connection with the person and the corpus that they're working with, and that's why they will push for change. The final thing I want to talk about is companies in terms of the case that they missed. 
The first thing that we said was worker productivity gets better because they feel that their labor is heard. This received no response. So even the idea that a high-level managerial executive, someone you thought you would never see in your lifetime, except for one of those PR factory doors sitting next to you, is an affirmation of the value that you're putting into the company. This means that happier workers, workers who feel that their labor has productivity, tend to be more productive. That's the first reason it's better for companies. But the second reason they missed was a diseconomy of scale wow. argument. These companies tend to be big. Feedback gets lost in these big companies because people at the bottom actually have very great ideas for these companies. It's just that these ideas never get to the top because they have to go through 20 levels of a crusted bureaucracy. In our world, these people have access to these executives directly. What that means is that when they have an idea about how to optimize the factory, when they have an idea about how to improve HR applications, they are talking to the person who's literally in charge. This makes these companies better because bigger companies' only problem is feedback loops. The communication doesn't get through. We established that direct channel of communication. This is stuff they did not deal with. Now, talking about words for workers on opening opposition. Before that, I would love to take some closing engagement. That's yeah. Right. At the point at which Amazon will, on either side of the house, monitor you with an automated AI that will fire you if you fail to meet your targets for driving for the day, why is there any delta at the point at which Jeff Bezos happens to be in your office for six months? I mean, because Jeff Bezos is, is running the AI, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the entire point of the motion. It's that when you set up technologies, whether they're social or like you know digital, those are technologies implemented by said company. So presumably, if Jeff Bezos would be fired by his own AI, I think that would be a great New York Times article. That's the entire point that we're talking about. All right, words for workers first. Firstly, it's interesting that there's a tension in the argument here where simultaneously they're saying, they're gonna come in, they're gonna be like, guys, this econometric regression isn't that hard. Let me just fire you and hire like an artificial intelligence. But simultaneously, it's gonna be so hard that the company will become inefficient, right? Like they realistically have to pick one of these groups in terms of what the reasonable majority of cases is. But secondly, and much more importantly, these workers won't feel monitoring. These workers won't feel scrutiny because the scrutiny is on the place of the executive. Remember this, the scrutiny is on the only person there who has a managerial position. So it's the flip side. But secondly, on unionizing and efforts on workers' rights, think about the number of people you know who are in unions. I mean, it's 7% of America, I know how big of an argument it is. But let's just say that you know someone in a union. How many of those are you know, uncomfortable talking in front of a high-level managerial executive? I'm generally asking, right? It's just their dream come true. For anyone who wants to unionize, for anyone who wants to push for reform, to do harassment complaints, the exact thing they wanted all of this time was to have access to these people in the first place. I don't think occupational discomfort quite cuts it as an argument. Go ahead. If your wealthy managers are so spoiled and distant as you say in the very first place, are not they more likely downplay the importance of entry-level jobs? I mean, sure, they downplay the importance of entry-level jobs, but they still have to do the entry-level jobs. I just don't get the argument, right? Because what you're missing again is you're brushing up against the reality that they have to be in there for six months, right? Like, you can do whatever you want in terms of framing what these jobs are like, automation, all that stuff. Realistically, they have to be in that job. Which brings me to my final point here, right? A lot of their arguments are in the context of these companies might become inefficient in the future. Firstly, note all of our claims about this economies of scale, more productive workers, feedback loops, all of that stuff. But secondly, why would companies make stupid decisions, right? Presumably a high-level executive won't be like, well, I have 20 years of experience in a Wharton MBA, but because I've worked for six months, I'm gonna do something that's worse for my company. On some level, I think I can rely on the self-interest of companies to maximize this productivity. The only thing that changes is the bounds within which they're doing so. And those bounds are of personal experience and personal connection. They've now gone into this space where they know these people, they've met these people, they know what it works like, and that's why I think these companies would be better off. Final note on CEO, CEO's point seems to be like nothing changes on either side. If that's true, then OO technically doesn't have an argument. I know I did that, but you know what, fair enough. Proud of course. Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Connor, the author
to be very clear about what the difference between the two teams are in this debate, I want to make two points here. The first is, in terms of the gut argumentation that says corporations will become more efficient because there's going to be more training of workers, etc., etc. First of all, for all of the reasons they give you as to why corporations are likely to be profit-oriented, if it was genuinely beneficial for a corporation to implement a particular policy, they would have done so already. Meaning that it's extremely unclear what the meaningful difference between the two teams are in terms of their benefits to workers. But secondly and more importantly, this is a huge concession on behalf of that team. Because if it is the case that corporations will only do things that benefit their workers or do things that corporations would think are going to be beneficial for workers, and if their argument is true, that like whenever a higher level executive suggests something that's extremely stupid as a result of its experience, it's going to be that case that an even higher level executive is going to override that, then it's probably not the case that a lot of the implementations that they're going to be talking about are going to be implemented. Yes, maybe one executive is going to like become buddies with like the workers that they're working with, and or like in their own self-interest suggest particular policies, those policies will be overridden because it is not in the interest of that corporation to eventually implement that policy, meaning that there's not that much offense they're going for in this state. The second thing I want to clarify is in terms of their whole idea on like, oh, what exactly is the difference in the treatment of workers? They say corporations know your every move anyway. It's a question of how exactly workers feel about it, i.e. when there isn't a person in the room that is watching you, workers feel like they are more free to talk to the workers around you, even if eventually you do know that you're going to be evaluated on certain things. It's like the daily level interactions that individuals have that changes under our side, and they don't actually engage with the claim that we make here. But secondly, it is also oftentimes the direct pressure, because if it is the case that workers are treated so poorly, when an executive comes into the room, they're more likely to feel threatened as a result of that, and therefore they're un likely to engage. Yes, maybe some unionized workers are going to approach the higher level workers, but as I've already explained, that's not going to lead to higher level change under their side. Before I go on further, I'll take closing if you have anything. Yeah, so this secondment is like two weeks long. Why does this move the needle on unionization and being feeling threatened by management? Oh, don't I grow thing. Next. <laughs> uh, sure. In any job you have, the management will always be there, and they will always mistreat you by your own argument. The difference is now that guy's boss's boss's boss is there. So maybe they can't do the bad things that they're doing to you before because like, if they harass you or something, someone else watches them. Like your overwatch argument is its own self. No, it doesn't, because it is probably the case that when there is conflict between like a higher level worker and a lower level worker, as a lower level worker, you probably don't have any confidence that the highest level of the boss is going to take your side. And therefore, the margin of that is also unclear. The only margin that they go for is the idea that you're able to shine a spotlight that you cannot hide behind corporate bureaucracy. The problem with this argument is that corporations can always find another excuse to not implement a particular policy, so it's really unclear what the change that they're going for is. Given that that's the case, I want to talk about two things in this speech. Those are the things that like just do not have an impact on the round from their side. Firstly, I want to talk about workers, and I want to first ask the question of how exactly it is that executives react to this. Oftentimes, there's going to be two things here. One, they are going to view it as a chore. I love that they gave the pro bono example of law firms. The, the highest tier workers at law firms do not treat the pro bono stuff seriously because they do not think that it is something that matters to their job. It is an extension of their job rather than something that actually changes their behavior. What that then means is that what Maddie told you in terms of how your attitudes do not change are still there because you view it as an extension of your job. You think, oh, I'm going to go there and gather some information in terms of how workers are treated, but eventually I'm going to come back and do my job, meaning that your fundamental incentives as a human being does not change. I want you to remember that as you evaluate the rest of the argument as I go through them. The first claim that government makes is the idea that you're going to be able to improve policies under their side. What? Oftentimes, the worst instances of reaction are going to happen. That is, you view this as a way in which you can do your executive position better, and therefore the way in which you implement this policy is like, oh, we're going to automate these jobs, or we're going to be cutting these jobs because we feel that this job is not necessary, or we don't perhaps need 10 people to do this. And the impact of that is individuals who they care about so much are going to be losing jobs and unemployed, not able to put food on the table under their side of the house, and we think that's an actively worse thing than like, yes, maybe your conditions at your job are like that, but at least you have a job to sustain yourself. The second thing I want to claim here, though, is if it is true that oftentimes these executives are self-interested, the <coughs> ways in which you attempt to improve those jobs are going to be worse, i.e. it's going to be like targeting certain industries or targeting certain departments over other departments because you know that you're going to be ending up in that particular department, and therefore it doesn't really get the consideration of what exactly the corporation needs. But secondly, oftentimes this is trumped by things like executive compensation. Because yes, individuals hate being mistreated for six months, but they also really like being able to get their bonus at the end of the day. And that's a meaningful comparison.
comparison that Maddie gives you that isn't engaged with under their stock. Present. No, thank you. The second claim I want to engage with is Aditya's second claim on like, oh, you get more contact theory and like people become friends with each other. I want to be very clear here. Maybe if people were interacting entirely in the abstract, this argument would be true. But oftentimes when people interact with each other, they oftentimes confirm the negative biases first. That means that you don't have the initial stage of becoming friends or becoming like close in the first place because the negative biases on what workers are likely to do or like how elitist you are are the ones that come into play in the beginning. And therefore, oftentimes these relationships relationships are actually going to be worse off. I want to be clear on the comparative. Having these relationships be acrimonious or oftentimes patronizing is actively worse than not having these relationships at all. Because if you didn't have these relationships at all, you would at least give workers the benefit to the extent that you think it would help a corporation. Once you realize that these people are not the types of people that are needed at your corporation, it is more likely that you dispose of these workers. The final claim that Aditya makes is in terms of how you get mobile, a mobile mobility through like myth mimicking and like work learning from corporations. First of all, I just think it's like, it's really unclear what you are learning from these workers. Like maybe if it's like, like stuff like diligence or whatever, I think it's a bit patronizing to say that lower level workers just do not have these skills or cannot learn these things. But secondly and more importantly, their claim on like how you can eventually get promoted is actually damning for their stock. Because when the executive is there, that means that every person has to try to pander to that executive because that can be tied into your promotion decision eventually. Oftentimes your executive's biased perceptions based on things like race, based on things like gender, are far more likely to take place as opposed to a more holistic evaluation of how promotion happens. This actually screws old workers over even more. The final thing I want to deal with in this speech is in terms of co companies. And they talk about how there are like inefficiencies at access. We would argue that the claim is here. The claim is this. Executives oftentimes are able to do other things during that time, i.e. being able to improve the size of the corporation, being able to make sure that the corporation is doing innovation as opposed to other things, and making sure that the corporation is eventually able to hire more individuals. Obviously in this round, there are other ways to gain change for workers, i.e. the unionization stuff that Maddie talked about, but it's not clear that through like the executives literally being there that has to be done. On the other hand, we provide individuals with more innovation, more jobs, extremely proud of this. As the team that is maybe least tainted by finance and big corporations, we're going to win by explaining what exactly the hype train that goes on in Thunder's heads looks like. Because the real constraint is not just what bosses think. The constraint is also what people at the top are willing to accept. And the people at the top are not just the CEOs and the CFOs. They are the people who fund corporations at the largest levels. This looks like private equity firms. This looks like shareholders. This looks like people that are dumping massive amounts of money into it. This looks like the pension fund managers, the people and the elites at the top that simply do not understand what happens at the ground level. So this is what answers OO's big question to OG, which is, if this is so beneficial to firms, why don't they do this in the status quo? We are going to argue that there's a systematic misunderstanding of what's going on in corporations at the lowest level, and show, therefore, why it's bad. What the argument is, is that there's game theory, that people have biases, that if one corporation knows that it's bad to not have interaction with people at the lowest level from your C-level executives, then they still can't act on it. Why? Because they won't attract the best talent, because they won't attract the best funders, because they won't attract the people that end up mattering. So even if it is good for them, it is still marginally worse for them because they don't get any funding in these, uh, on the other side. They don't, they don't get investment from private funders. They don't get investment from the status quo. Um, so two quick responses to OO aside from that. First, in terms of like workers organizing, I do think that the OG response here is adequate, but probably it's just that this doesn't happen in the workplace. It's not that workers stand in and like while they're doing their job, they're massively overworked. They also have time to be chit-chatting. It's largely that it happens in text threads and group chat outside of the workplace, so I don't think that changes. 
Second, in terms of efficiency, I think firstly, low-level inefficiencies are massively important. I think that managers are far less important than we might think. Changing a 5% efficiency at an input level of your organization, such as, for instance, if every time someone enters data, it takes two times as long as it needs to be, that makes the rest of your organization hugely more inefficient. It makes the reports come out much more slowly, makes it so that we have less accurate information when making decisions at the top level. So the low level really does matter. But the second thing going down is that trial periods are also hugely beneficial. Having a manager at the top level does not mean that that person is necessarily always doing their management job the absolute best way. Having more people rotating through these management cycles means that you have more people that are able to say, hey, maybe let's try this slightly different thing in the office and see how it goes. Hey, maybe we have a slightly better talent to uh, like do this particular job. I think that means the high level offices are more likely to be better run as well because you have rotation through them. For the vast majority of the time, the top manager is still there, but the fact that you now have people rotating through means that you get to try out talent, means that the direct report who might be, uh, who might be promoted soon has a chance to try out the job and figure out how good they are, but also that you have a chance to see different managerial tactics at that high level. That's actually hugely beneficial. Okay, so why do we win this debate? Because we agree with opening opposition that empathy only goes so far, and I think that there are three reasons why we outweigh sort of the opening empathy claim. The first thing is that Broadly, I think that the high-level executives that are going down can avoid a lot of the harms, and this is alluded to by opening opposition, that they can afford their own goods, things like healthcare, for instance, even if it's not provided by the workers. Even if the work does not provide them adequate services, doesn't provide them enough food, whatever else it is, they can afford that on their own and provide those benefits for themselves. Second thing is, they avoid a lot of the consequences. So like the Jeff Bezos example is a perfect example of this, because Jeff Bezos is never going to get fired by the algorithm, and therefore the C-level executive doesn't care about like not performing to the middle manager's concerns. The second thing to point out is the resentment argument that is brought up by opening opposition. I do think that that's absolutely true, that in many cases, the C-level executive is going to go down and be really, really upset, and as a result, come out with worse beliefs about what these individuals are like. Think, oh, well, the people I was working with are lazy. Oh, these are lowlifes. I don't care that much about them. I think that's a really bad thing as well. The third thing is that changing the minds of professional managers, funders, and shareholders is just difficult. You can't go and just have a purely empathetic appeal and say, well, I really care about these people. Like, you know, these people that I work with, great friends, because they're not the funders' friends. And so ultimately, what matters most in this debate is explaining why to the bottom line of the company this matters. So what is our argument? We're going to say that there are huge organizational inefficiencies that hurt workers, but also hurt organizations, tapping into all of the opening impacts. So what do these look like? I think these are, these are things that hurt the workers' bottom line. And look, I think that um, you do this as a C-level executive coming back, because coming back, you want to say that you had something to show for all this time that you spent away. You want to reestablish yourself in the workplace. You want to say, well, I haven't lost it, and show it to coworkers, and show it to the people that are promoting you, or funding you, or whatever else it is, that you're still good at your job. So you want to have a deliverable relatively quickly. What does that look like? It looks like pointing out that hiring and training is incredibly expensive. So if we can decrease the turnover at the bottom levels of our workplace, it'd be hugely beneficial. But here's a specific way to decrease turnover by treating employees better in this specific way. Here is the specific problem that they're concerned about, as opposed to just generally saying that turnover is expensive. Secondly, I think that when morale is low, individuals are less likely to do their jobs very well. They're less likely to work extra hard on that report. They're less likely to give you the best data. They're more likely to fudge numbers often because they're wage workers. They don't get bonuses. They don't believe that they're going to go up the corporate ladder. And thirdly, because shitty middle managers often obscure the information that gets up to you, that is to say that workers do not, uh, workers do not have a pipeline up. Therefore, you don't have good information about what's happening on the ground. Therefore, there are many things that cause inefficiencies at the lowest level that otherwise C-level executives would not know or have access to. Closing well, Yeah, don't you think that at the point at which a middle manager has to go into the shittiest warehouse on Amazon, their response will not be, ah, I don't want I want to liberalize working conditions. Won't it be, ah, I'll just automate all these jobs away so I never have to do this again the next time I get there? Yes, because obviously the middle manager has the ability to automate all the jobs away. I think that C-level executives care most about the bottom line, and I think exactly what we're talking about is better on our side of the house. In some cases, automation may be appropriate. I think in the vast majority of cases, it's not automation, but simply treating the workers better so that they can do their job well, which is why they haven't automated already. So. What is the problem? Point. Second part of this extension, actually, yeah. Yeah, C-level executives want to outdo each other anyway and try to compete with each other anyway. So what exactly is the meaningful difference between the two teams? Because again, they've never spoken to the issue on the ground because they've never had the experience with the issue on the ground. They've never said, look, these are the specific issues. I observed it myself. What they do is fall back on all of the biases that I'm about to talk about. 
Why is it that high-level individuals often have biases and therefore don't have good reflection of what's happening on the ground? Firstly, because they're watching closely for worker productivity, but specifically through the lens of bias mechanisms, like, for instance, the algorithms that they talk about, the worker surveillance that occurs increasingly under their side of the house, where you manage the number of clicks that your workers are doing, or you follow where they are with literal trackers. I think that increasingly there's a bias toward these sorts of things because they give you algorithmic and mathematical solutions, as opposed to what the worker or CEO has actually seen. The CEO, again, high-level managers, are the only people that you trust to cut through the analysis provided by these numerical measures. Secondly, because they love cutting costs. Often what we have is private equity firms that are coming in and saying, like, look, we want to cut costs. The easiest way to do that, by cutting costs at the lowest level. Third, because there's a politicization of worker rights. The idea that worker rights are good is often seen as left-wing as opposed to a genuine uh, business view. And fourth, because generally these people are highly elite and just don't believe anyone who doesn't talk like them. So I think what we get under our side of the house is CEOs being able to credibly say, look, here is a better way to promote worker rights. I think that we get that under our side of the house. Finally, this is important because it changes the conditions of workers in that corporation, but also everywhere. Under their side of the house, there is varying empathy. Under our side of the house, we show that this is literally better for every single corporation to pursue, and therefore funders and CEOs at the top level of every company have to pursue it. Very, very proud to propose. <laughs> First, I'm going to explain why management and executives having to work entry-level jobs dramatically fucks corporate structures in a way far more pernicious than what opening opposition did, then I'll weigh it against all other teams in the debate. Opening opposition says when upper management descends to entry-level, they're more likely to fire employees or move towards automation because upper management sees how entry-level jobs are struggling to work a spreadsheet and get mad. This is not the reason it fucks corporate structures dramatically. The reason why is because when management has to work entry-level jobs, they have to do far more menial labor that is often more risky or at the very least far more boring. When these jobs are just exhausting, physically taxing, like lifting lots of boxes, or just incredibly menial, it's far more likely that every management employee in the company who has to go through this will want to put significant pressure on the company to give out way more benefits to their executives at the expense of lower workers. Now, opening opposition gestures vaguely at this argument. I'm going to prove specifically why you unite management and executive incentives in such a way that you draw significant amounts of capital away from new hires, away away from R&D, away from innovation, and towards the middle management bloat in the company to a significant extent. Why will this happen? Firstly, these managers will likely feel quite unhappy at having to work these kinds of divisions. When they can make this unhappiness very clear at board meetings, consistently, and not perform well at their managerial roles, and so on, this likely means that the company has this omnipresent urge of people constantly coming back over each rotation and talking to these individuals and putting consistent pressure on them in order to change their policies in such a way that are more beneficial to offset the cost of them having to do this. Secondly, right now, managers, C-suite executives, and various levels of the company might have different priorities. Lower management and upper management may disagree on significant prioritization about how the company is run. At the point at which you implement a single policy that they all dislike, you unite the different factions who might be lobbying the company for different benefits to give larger compensation to all of them to offset the sheer cost of this policy. Thirdly, these managers often have the most leverage to exact concessions from the company. Why? Because they fill a critical link between CEOs and lower level workers. Insofar as they're harder to train and replace, and it takes far more to train them into doing these kind of mini labor, it means they'll likely lobby aggressively to get these compensation in other ways. Thirdly, these managers often have far more mobility, so they can leave to a different company fairly easily if their benefits are met to a significantly greater degree because their skills are often cross-applicable and cross-transferable to other skill sets. There's an incentive for the company's topmost executives and board to appease them to a significantly greater degree, and there's them appease menial blue-collar workers they can always hire more of, and so on and so forth. Thirdly, working many low-level jobs at Amazon often opens you up to significantly more physical risks. When you have a perception of more physical risk because you're working like more menial jobs that could lead to injuries, potentially, you probably want better insurance plans to compensate for those kinds of things, and you're likely to push for that significantly. What does this do? Firstly, you get managers being paid far more in terms of executive compensation than they were before, because now you can put pressure on the board and CEO to pay out more money to the managers to raise their salaries and to pay for more insurance plans. What this means is that insofar as capital is zero sum, and some can be allocated to workers, some can be allocated to management, and some can be allocated to R&D, they hire less to workers in R&D, and they pay more out to those other individuals. They also just hire fewer workers, right? Because now they have less capital to pay. They pay for worse training programs for entry-level workers at the point where they have to trade this off in terms of money. Why would they cut costs there specifically at the lowest level rather than elsewhere in the company? Firstly, by OG's own admission, workers 
with limited unionization and bargaining power. Therefore, it's easy to cut wages and trainings and so on with limited complaint because the left capacity to organize to a significant degree. Secondly, there's less likely to be a high degree of resentment among all of the executives towards this policy to a significantly greater degree. Because they have more leverage through social media, because they can call out the practices to a wider extent, they have, when they have more connections with the board and shareholders in higher man management levels, they're far more likely to be able to exact these kinds of concessions. But secondly, you get companies having to pay out higher bonuses to these executives. This means they get a smaller R&D budget to innovate things like new projects, less money to reinvest in the company's most innovative areas, and far less ability to get cheap prices to consumers. This means you get higher prices in the market as a whole, as consumers get charged more per penny, and they have to pay more for kinds of goods and things like that. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, it asymmetrically affects smaller companies worse, because they have to pay a higher proportion of their income towards these executives that are offset the cost of the policy. This means that smaller firms and innovative startups have to pay more money to executives than, say, Amazon, and can't eat the cost of just giving these managers a raise as easily. This means you get less competition in the market and far more consolidation on their side. This also means you get higher prices on consumers due to the monopolization of the market to a significant set. Finally, you incentivize far faster automation on their side. Now, open opposition says this, but they don't prove a tipping point because plausibly Gov is right that automation wants to happen anyway in many instances. The reason automation happens faster is because the executives move away specifically from companies that involve really terrible grunt work because they never want to end up in the manufacturing vertical of Amazon. They'd much rather end up in, say, a lower level tech firm where they can still work a white collar job and do like data entry. Therefore, they'll move over because their skill sets are cross a company that just doesn't have manufacturing verticals. So you get far more concentration of executives in companies that aren't vertically integrated with manufacturing, which puts pressure on those companies to automate away jobs far more quickly. Why does it be OG? OG says that corporate standards get better for workers because the conditions of these jobs make them better. Even if this is true, I posit they might feel bad, but they want to look out for themselves first. Why? Because the self is more proximate to you. You can rationalize about caring for your family more, and therefore you're likely to prioritize advocating those things secondly. But secondly, it disproves their claims about how the degree to which you can meaningfully improve conditions for the workers. Because at the point at which even if you do advocate for improved conditions for the workers, it's likely offset by the less hiring that the workers get, and likely offset by far more, trading on far more ability for like to giving them higher wages. It also outweighs open in government because we affect far more people. We affect all of the consumers in the market who pay significantly higher prices for goods. This is a larger stakeholder group, so even if goods get better for some companies slightly on their side of the house, far more people on aggregate are affected. We also affect far more workers because far more workers can get jobs at the point which is applied across the entire economy. So the scale of our impact is significantly larger. Before I go on, opening. So the CEO extension is you're going to massively restructure comp uh, like compensation, insurance, all things that would probably expose you to lawsuits when people doing the same work get different insurance packages instead of just like making the jobs better. Three responses. They do different work. That's why they're management, so they do have to pay more. Secondly, it doesn't have to be a massive restructuring. All it has to be is a few more executive compensation packages down the line that would have other gone to more training programs, that more abilities for the lower labor force to interact with higher management, more opportunities to hire slightly more people. The trade-off in capital is significant, and even if you believe, even if you believe OG is entirely correct that to some extent they get slightly better protections, our impact is significantly larger because the higher prices, the less R&D, and the far less accessible products to far more individuals affects a broader line of stakeholders. CG. So say that you have to pay the executive 500k more. They are then forced, because the board and shareholders expect them to get something out of this experience, they're forced to say, here is how we can improve the worker conditions on the ground in order to improve optimal work. No, conditions. they're not at all forced to do that. At the point at which they have to experience that, they'll say, ah, I never want to have to go through that kind of thing again. Therefore, I will put pressure on the company to automate away those jobs. And if I can't, I will leave that company for a white collar startup where the lowest opportunity cost I can work job is much less like taxing, less physical, and so on and so forth. Why does it be every team in the round? OG says this policy will be a tipping point for better corporate standards. Our claim is there are already significant costs to deter companies from being super shitty. And if these costs are not significant enough, the company is unlikely to change their behavior on either side. Note the rise of social media and the ability to call out bad labor practices symmetric, as are abuses that lead to unionization in the status quo already, which is what happened in Amazon and New York to an extent. Secondly, loss of business and reputation happens at the point where companies are particularly abusive, so workers have the capacity to go to another company in many instances, even if it's, if it's not like Amazon. Thirdly, even if they can't claim deniability, companies don't want to bear the cost of the lawsuits, they all have a preemptive incentive to practice better labor standards to avoid losing money. And fourthly, the incentive to allow people to move up and get a degree of mobility that is interactions and workplace of greater degree of interaction, so a company doesn't offer up mobility, there's probably greater risk of resignation. So it's unclear to change management practices, because there's like a frightening degree of insight already that exists at the lower level because you can already like you can observe people with drones and like AI monitoring, but it definitely changes the degree which workers are affected because the company hires fewer workers at the point which they can extend more to those workers in the first place. Incredibly proud of you from CG. See you. Sorry, I have a few
Our extension in this debate is very simple and it's very important. Break it down into three premises. One, we will accept the fact that CEOs are largely incentivized by profit, which takes us above OG because I think they have to stretch to make this point about empathy. Our point, however, is that their way of going about maximizing profit is systematically biased because of the certain biases that upper level managers tend to have when they're sitting in the office. There are a deviation to things like profit metrics, there are deviations to things like DCFs without understanding the human element and how that affects profit within business. Our argument is that this motion gives these people visibility into insights that allow them to determine a better way of maximizing profit that more closely aligns themselves with workers' incentives. I think a fantastic example of this that Matt gave is that it's extraordinarily hard to quantify the impact of morale on productivity in workers. For example, when you are being overworked and you're an investment bank, that works 14 hours a day, you are genuinely more likely to put out worse things that because of the fact that you're so tired, more likely to have greater uh, mistakes in your work. You're less likely to actually be super dedicated to your work. A better example, if you are super stressed about having such low pay, the fact that you don't have health care, the fact that you're stressed about whether or not you can put food on the table for your kids, that genuinely means you are less likely to be productive on the factory floor, you're less likely to be productive in the entry level job, and that impacts on the bottom line of the company. However, our point was that this is something that is tremendously difficult for managers who understand if they do not actually work the job. When you're obsessed with a DCF and the cost under light items, when your investors are obsessed with those things, when your managers are obsessed with those things, it's very difficult for you to even come to the conclusion that yeah, the reason my company is so inefficient is because all these people lack healthcare and all these people are incredibly stressed. Why does this place above OG? Four reasons. One, their argument for workers' rights is just this argument about empathy. I don't think they have anything tied to the bottom line that, that aligns itself with workers' rights. Maybe the only argument here is that yeah, they can't hide behind emails. I would say that they can't hide behind these things anyway, but even if they could, who are they accountable to, right? Who will punish them for not pretending to respond to an email? I think that doesn't align itself with the bottom line. We say that this actually changes their mindset and it changes, solves for the biases that they have that systematically bias themselves against uh, things like workers' rights that affect your bottom line but are part of the human element of their job, number, not the numbers part of the job. Two, they say it's better for companies and that gets closer to our argument here, but I think if they don't impact this to workers' rights, we have a far more important impact that I'll weigh below. Third, we answer the question of why these companies would not do these things in the first place. Because I don't think they have a response to this. Yes, it's the case that you know companies are likely to do training programs because they know that that's something that's important, but on our side of the house, we explain that there are things that are unquantifiable that you can only understand when you work on the factory floor that affect your bottom line. And fourth, we uh, I think profit maximization is important just to mitigate the empathy point a little bit. I think broadly they're still obligated to their shareholders. They're obviously, they're most of the time compensated by things that are related to their stock price, for example, as these guys say. So I think they're more likely to focus on those things. Why do we outweigh everybody else in this debate? One, I think we actually have an answer to how do we improve workers' rights and how does this motion improve workers' rights? These are the most vulnerable individuals. So yeah, even if we maybe decrease some other some other benefits to other workers, these are the people that are most closely aligned to these things. Second, our extension certainly makes the least assumptions the round. That is to say, we can improve these things while assuming that these CEOs are genuinely terrible people who are just closely more aligned with the pro with, with the bottom line of their company. I'll take opening. Upper level management will always value quantitative measures of performance and morale for all the same reasons you mentioned. So isn't it as likely that they will be ridiculed in board meetings if they mention their analogical experience? Yeah, so three arguments. One is that even if you prove that these guys are ridiculed, or even if you prove that these guys like do this, focus on these sorts of metrics regardless, this gives them the ammunition to go into those board meetings and say, yes, I worked in this for six months. This was Matt's point about having a deliverable to present because the reason they send you into these places for six months is so you can garner experience on what it looks like to be on the bottom line. That's what these people expect. But second, you're not going to get ridiculed because everybody else in the board meeting had the same experience because everybody in the company does this sort of thing. So I'd like you to understand, yeah, you know what, fuck it, it is true that the reason we were sending out so many deliverables with mistakes because everybody was super overworked. Let's hire more people or let's give them better hours. Responses to uh, the other closing team. I have seven of them. One, the, the motion says that the majority of companies do this, which means that it is unlikely to be the case that your single company is differentiated from all the other ones. Two, you often have little other option. If you work in a middle management of the business, you have already climbed the ladder in that business because you develop other people's trust. You don't want to start brand new at another company. It's very hard to laterally hire when you're in management because it takes time to establish your, your credentials and your trust within a company. Third, why does the better improvement have to be compensation, right? If you're in profit related company, a better way, specifically about the insights that I've worked with that I talked to you about before, is more likely to be like giving you better hours, giving you more benefits, things that don't necessarily cost a lot, but still better your relationship with the company. Fourth, oftentimes the reason these people still have no leverage is because if you're a middle manager, compensation is important to you. The way you get higher compensation is by climbing the ladder and promoting yourself within the business. So you still have an incentive to pander to the upper managers, not lobby for more important things, because you just want to get promoted. That's the thing that gives you more money. That's
that's the thing I give you bigger bonuses. F uh, five, this happens once every five years. I don't think it's the end of the world, and I don't think you'll lobby for a half a million dollar improvement in your compensation. Six, this is important. There is game theory around uniting, which is why the, there are unions that exist. If your point is that middle managers are going to unionize, right? The, the, like this is the, specifically the argument. There is a marginal incentive for you as a person to be the person that doesn't include in this corporate that this on this coalition that's demanding management for higher pay because that means that you'll look better to higher management, which means you're more likely to get the promotion and the whole thing unravels. These people won't rally around this whole thing. But seven, the kicker: we told you this gets you higher incentive for uh, higher investment from investors because you can go to them and tell them we're improving the bottom line of our business by improving our productivity by giving these workers better rights, which means you have more capital to pay higher salaries. I'll take closing. You can threaten to leave. You don't actually have to leave, which makes them listen to you. And better stocks, better hours, and other benefits cost money. It's not a massive restructuring. It's just a funding trade-off, but it's the most significant impact of the thing. I don't think it's a significant, significant impact. For all the reasons I gave, I think it's actually extraordinarily marginal. You get higher investment, and yeah, you can threaten to leave. Our point is that that is a threat that doesn't actually have much of an impact. These people know that you want to get promoted, and even if you do actually quit, just hire somebody else. I don't think this is actually that important. You don't have a coalition around where everybody is going to quit at once. On opening opposition, a couple of responses. One, this is a short secondment. Yes, I fucked up the POI, it's about two weeks, but it is still six months, which means that the entire union is not going to collapse in that particular amount of time. But I think Matt also made two important points here. One, well, most of the things they say about like workers, uh, like, like the working conditions and things like that are largely symmetric with the boss. The boss still is an incentive to surveil upon the people. The boss still is an incentive to threaten workers to work better. All those things still exist on their side of the house. But second, workers can like unionize covertly within WeChat groups, within cell phones. They just wanted to stay around the boss. That's an important thing. They say companies will do this anyway. We explain why they don't because they don't have the level of insight into the important things that actually drive productivity that relate themselves to workers' rights. They say higher managers will reject this. This was the response they gave before where everybody in the board meeting has had that experience and they expect a deliverable out of you, which is really important. They say uh, people see it as a chore. I already explained why this isn't that important and it's closely to, related to what closing said. They say uh, you're likely to, uh, like the relationships are negative, you cut workers, you're likely to panic your management. I explained why all those things are genuinely less important to the question of what management does, what management thinks, and what management believes about running the company, which is the fact that you can only observe the impact of higher morale, of high stress, of being overworked, of all these things on your bottom line unless you're actually on the floor with these individuals. We create that missing link and plug that missing link. That's why we take the debate. POIs uh, don't verbally, uh, or like don't just keep standing up or just let you know when I'm ready to take one. I'll probably take one at one slash two and one right before. I want to be back again. Okay. <laughs> Great. Three, two, one. I want to make one thing at the top very clear why the trade off is substantially large. It's a large trade-off because managing pay is largely a very disproportionate portion of firm structure pay given every average informed voter knows since like the 70s, CEO pay is largely like quintupled or quadrupled. But also keep in mind, it's likely plausible insofar as firms pay a lot of money to manage because they make strategic level decisions. And because there's like increased competition and globalization firms want to compete, it's very likely that they are willing to spend a lot more and fork over. And if they have a lot of power asymmetry and you put an unprecedented cost upon them, it's likely that it's going to be a large surge large size of the pie. So it's not going to be marginal, but largely very uh, uh, important. Secondarily, I want to make one piece of weighing clear. When you have to balance the worker's argument versus the like firm efficiency argument and optimization, you're going to weigh on firm optimization. Why is this the case? There's largely going to be very minimal delta on workers insofar as their interests or like the real ones that matter, like compensation and cost to create a real delta in this debate, are directly zero sum with shareholders and the firm outcome. That is to say, if you really want to maximize the wages of workers, really up the entire like 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 warehouse, it's directly oppositional to the interests of the management at the top that makes the decision for the profitability of the firm. So any sort of real delta that you get from empathy or connection, whatever you get from worker management, is likely going to be 
being pretty small in this debate and not going to largely change. Secondarily, the reason why firm efficiency or quality matters more, insofar as one, it affects the prices of goods that affect everyone largely in society, so outside of those workers, but secondarily, it's a large part of the firm structure. So if we care about the amount of money we can otherwise give to workers, the size that CEOs otherwise take that could otherwise go elsewhere is a large part of how, we, uh, how much money we have to affect workers and their quality of life. Keep in mind why this argument is largely the most important in this round before getting into team by team comparisons. It is the it is based on the mutual exclusivity of the impact. The analysis that Matt tells you explains why it's likely that they have lots of power to tell the company to make up for making them fucking with boxes, and that it is an unprecedented action that they have a lot of ability to say, yes, we agreed on a $5 million payout like last year, but on the next contract come up, because you made me work in these unprecedented conditions that nobody else expected me to otherwise do, it's likely that I'm going to ask for a lot more. That trade-off, whether or not you buy it's like, like buy very good or bad, at the very least you know that it is a mutually exclusive impact, whereas I don't know whether or not you really improve the quality of life for workers. On team by team comparisons on CG, the response to us is, well, you might get something valuable for that overcompensation, right? Insight into workers. We say you could get that same insight and info for substantially cheaper without substantially overcompensating CEOs. Why? Because they say, ah, CEOs need something credible to show to like the board, right? I work with them, I have all of this info. One. Why don't you just create anonymous surveys to understand what the workers otherwise want to do? Secondarily, there are literal consulting companies that exist to provide that information for you that companies hire themselves. But the difference in the trade-off and the upshot, it's far cheaper to just hire them because they already have a business model attempted to do it. It's probably going to be more efficient and it's probably going to provide you a lot better info than a CEO that you don't know if they're rational or not because they were drunk when they were talking to their otherwise uh, like new colleague. So the upshot of CG is that Yes, like you might get some info, but it's a lot cheaper to get it. You probably have more money to get more of it on our side. Secondarily, on the argument about like rotation leads to less continuity of business practices, and that might be good. Why is it bad for a few reasons? Uh, one, when you don't know what new managers like, oh, when you don't know what the new managers are like, it probably creates substantially more stress in, uh, in the firm environment. Secondarily, when you re when you rotate a different manager, they're not conscious of workplace dynamics and can create far more stress within the management decision making. Thirdly, you exacerbate management inefficiencies of skill because new managers don't know how to manage the specific office dynamics as well insofar as the roles are largely different. And fourthly, the incentive to show your workers that you still got it, like they talk about, means that when you get back to that management management like position, you might overcompensate and be incredibly erratic or irrational to try to show that, oh, even though I packed boxes, I'm still, I still got the shit in me, I'm gonna make like a really risky business decision. Finally, on investment, the way you get less investment uh, is because you fuck up the structure and continuity of the firm. OG before getting into it. When we say, isn't it easy to just make jobs better? You're like, oh, it's just a few executive compensation packages. But when it's your extension, they're gigantic. They restructure the whole company. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. What we say is that the ability to substantially make jobs better comes at the zero-sum interest of those shareholders at the top. But the substantial core, core package of the individuals, like the CEOs, for example, the, the, the difference is the power dynamic that management is allowed to occupy and employ. When they can say we agreed on a specific set of costs and expectations with the job and you sign that contract, they're substantially able to reap out a lot more when you make them go through unprecedented actions that they otherwise didn't have to go through. But secondarily, I don't know why the delta is going to be substantially large, large with workers' wages or protection. Even if it's like a couple cents or a couple dollars, you have firm dynamics and practice that you already established into how you are able to like release different products into the market. So for you to substantially change the worker kind of conditions, you'd have to substantially change the model of the firm, and I don't know why they have the incentive to do that. On OG, more rebuttal. They say that worker standards improve, and this is going to take them out in, in a way that OA doesn't, which also puts us over them. You put a spotlight on workers because you can confront them and they have no plausible deniability. One, I don't know why they can't put you in a separate office or with the least militant workers so you don't like like empathize with the ones that are going to complain the most. Secondarily, large-scale worker improvements like the quality of the office and wages are done at the top management levels and have to appeal to shareholders who themselves would never allow it to happen in the first place because they're willing to spend for a like, competitive manager that's going to make them like beat the other C, uh, like SNF 500 firm. But I don't know why they're going to give a shit when you say this guy wants to like put his kid through college. Like I don't know why they're otherwise going to give a shit. Secondarily, on the individual incentive to like have fun during the six month period. The point is yes, but they overcompensate with that. So the incentive you create to create better <coughs> conditions for workers means they have less money to otherwise redistribute. OG, another one or CG? Go. Yeah, so the issue is that these CEOs don't have leveraging power because every other firm still has these, uh, the, the same policy, which is that you also have to do those things. 
So what they want to do is come out of this with a good policy that improves the productivity of the company, improves your bottom line, and therefore improves your compensation package. I already responded to this by saying they could just hire a cheap firm to otherwise provide them that information without giving CEOs more leverage to take money away. And also just anonymous surveys solve this entirely. So I don't know why your extension really matters in this debate. More about uh, uh, on beating uh, uh, OG. The crux of their case is that it's about spending time with them, right? being them and empathizing with them. Here's why it falls very quickly. You've already gone through the rungs. You know what it's like because you've lived there. You've had to become an entry level, then mid level management. So you know the struggles to begin with. So the whole crux and assumption of their case largely falls as far as you had to be a part of that to begin with, and you never thought to otherwise change it, uh, change it uh, uh, otherwise. On all why we beat them, Matt already did the weighing, so I don't need to do it within my speech, but largely their case hangs on assumptions. They get bad policy because managers are either resentful or that you need to remove them because they need to be removed to otherwise make good decisions. I don't know whether you need to do either of that. The only thing that I know is that they get to hoard more wealth that also otherwise doesn't get the company to be more efficient and put in research and development, or if they are like, like beneficial, pay their workers a lot more. That when you did this debate because it proved to what was actually mutually exclusive. Opposed.